Well, uh, my name is uh, Rutur Mahajan, and I'm going to talk some uh, recent work um, we've been doing across team spread across Microsoft, Princeton, and UCLA. I think uh, one thing you'd notice, this team is very top heavy. It has only one player, but four coaches. Uh, but uh, somehow it works, because the player's great. Um, and, and Ryan's in the room back there. I think Dave's also somewhere. Uh, yeah, Dave's also there. Um, OK, so before I jump in, I do want to throw out something. I think this, the, the timing of this workshop's great. Uh, but the reason it's being held, I think, is wrong. Uh, and I'm going to propose like, why algorithms and networks makes a lot of sense now. It has nothing to do with SDN. Essentially, this is the hypothesis. Like, you have very simple solutions and very smart solutions. I would posit the total cost of engineering, operational, and performance. Let's, per let's take efficiency as dollars per bit the network delivers. Uh, the shape somehow looks like the following, that essentially, to get started, these smart solutions, they cost a lot of money in terms of engineering and ops. But over time, as your infrastructure size grows, they kind of pay off because you're eking out more and more juice from the system, right? And the simple solutions have the opposite behavior that they start out low. They are very easy to engineer. Uh, ops tends to be easier because the engineering itself is easy. Ops is easy. But you know, their dollar per bit performance is kind of sucky or low. So, I think the reason I would say, and, and just give you some ideas around what simple versus smart solutions would be, you know, for, for the longest time before, you know, Google and Microsoft started doing kind of centralized traffic engineering, the, in the ISP space, our answer to most problems was over-provision. But at some scale, over-provisioning stopped working, and we must do intelligent resource allocation. As another example of simple versus smart, you know, we were living with best effort networks for the longest time, and we were happy with it. But now we do multiple priorities and try to give guarantees. And the nature of guarantees also have changed. We are used to optimize mean performance. Now we worry a lot about tail performance and whatnot. And developing these smart solutions is where the role for algorithms is coming in into networking. So nothing to do with SDNs, I would say. SDNs just happens to be there, I would say so. Um, and, and basically, I think this is, you probably have guessed it where we're saying, like for the lot of longest time, most of the infrastructure we were building was basically in this regime. So systems people like me would not worry about algorithms at all. And, but now, I think, uh, increasingly, we are living in this world with the scale of the networks we're building. Or uh, other way to think about scale is just kind of complexity, you know, the intent. The policy complexity is increasing, even if the number of nodes is not increasing. We are asking the infrastructure to do more and more. And this is where we are living today. And that's why we need algorithms, uh, if anything. Anyway, OK, so uh, with that, I'll jump into my talk. <laughs> um, and it's, it's all related, I think. It's, it's not completely divorced. Um, so this is kind of just my observations on where we have with kind of network programming and the journey we are taking in the research and operations community. OK, so, so let me clarify some terms here. I think there are two important axes to think about here. Uh, distributed programming basically means, are you programming individual devices, or are you programming network as a whole? So that's distributed versus centralized programming. A distributed control plane means like the forwarding and other behaviors in the network, are they being determined through interaction of individual boxes, or are they being programmed from the top with the, with the central controller? In there. OK, so these terms are clear. OK, by the way, feel free to just interrupt at any point. Uh, so this is where I would posit we started. We started with distributed programming. We program individual routers, and we started with distributed control planes. So this was great. Uh, I think we got a lot of resilience, and a particular type of resilience, which was resilient to actually failing components. You didn't need Paxos. You didn't need centralized algorithms or nothing. These things were just naturally resilient. If you go back and le read papers on why the internet was designed, it was designed to sustain a nuclear attack and whatnot. And I, I, I will tell you that. SDN controllers that are centralized will not sustain a nuclear attack. Uh, but the internet will. Uh, but what we lost in trying to live in this world, and I think it was very easy to bootstrap. So that's why internet kind of grew like wildfire, uh, because it had certain resilience and whatnot. But what we lost in that world was basically programmability, ease with which the networks could be programmed. And this is not to be taken lightly. So this is why I said like resilience is a certain form of resilience. But you know, correct programming is also about resilience. So we, f we lost a certain type of resilience or programmability. And thus, you see, basically, you know, uh, routing misconfigurations are top line news a uh, lot of days and whatnot. And it's not just about anecdotes. People have compiled data, both researchers and 
uh, other kind of bodies, and oftentimes, basically, misconfiguration, uh, network programming errors shows up as the top line item. Why uh, networks essentially network faults happen? So clearly, we kind of got something wrong there in some sense. Okay, so a lot of people observed that that it was very hard to uh, program networks uh, correctly. So we ended up here. So okay, so let's just do this. So we basically say, okay, let's do centralized programming because distributed programming is hard. And at the same time, we ended up with centralized control planes. And I'll tell you why. I think because centralized programming of centralized control planes is easier than centralized programming of distributed control planes. So we ended up what basically gets known towards SDN. Uh, I think the abstraction mismatch was narrowed between what the, program, what the program was doing and what the control plane was doing. And on top of that, people developed, essentially, uh, with some people in the room here as well, uh, developed languages that made it even easier than it would have been otherwise. And that's where we ended up. But what we lost was resilience. Now we are struggling to make these centralized controllers kind of resilient, trying to distribute them. And then the same elements of distributed control planes are now kind of coming back into the world mix at all. Amen. Uh, Ratul, so you, you're talking about data center network, right? I mean, I'm talking about kind of general network, data center, backbone, whatnot, yeah. Because in backbones, there are still these distributed protocols running. Um, some, some backbones, not all, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think the world hasn't completely moved. I just think like, you know, where as an arc, like research is going, our operations are going. So not everybody has moved over, which is good because, you know, you probably know where I'm going. So, you know, that's good. Uh, <laughs> and, and there's a reason. I think part of the reason is resilience. Part of the reason is we don't know how to reason about open world systems with SDNs and whatnot. And those were kind of part of the reasons that will take me to the top right box. Uh, but I'm just trying to simplify the story a little bit around why we are where we are. So okay, so, so this happened and we ran into some fundamental resilience limitations of centralized models. And then essentially I would say like this another line of work started. Okay, you know, can we just fix the programmability problem right here? So I would say like this line of network verification work um, that's happening um, uh, in particular control plane verification is kind of motivated by the same problem, but it's saying say, okay, let's try to live in this world because it's resilient but let's try to fix the programmability issues there by bringing verification technology to the fore. And over the last five, six years, we've made great strides. And some of the problems I would again say, since I have the podium, uh, have been solved. <laughs> and, and, and many remain. Uh, all right. Uh, so, okay. so, so this is the context of this work in my mind. And here's what we want to do. We like both resilience and we like programmability as well. So what we want to do is essentially end up at this box and asking the question, is it possible to essentially bridge these two? Can we do centralized programming abstractions running on top of honest to God distributed control planes? That's the question we set out to answer in this work. And the rest of the talk is going to focus uh, uh, on, on where we are. All right. Um, OK, so why is this hard? Um, the single most reason why this is hard is the mismatch in abstractions. When you talk about centralized programming, you automatically talk about network-wide policies. So, so policies that apply to the, all net, the entire network. And these policies could be of the shape, uh, to Oman's point, just kind of like a typical backbone policy. You could prefer one neighbor over the other. You don't you want to use your network as transit. You want to keep certain traffic within a region. A region could be geography or logical part of the network and you want to aggregate prefixes and whatnot. And these are very typical policies. These are not unique to Microsoft or AT&T, whatnot. These are very typical backbone policies. Think about it. These policies are not talking about routers and links at all. These are essentially your centralized policies as the network. But to actually implement these policies on top of distributed control planes, uh, these are the abstractions available today. You have to set all the link preferences, the reason about individual links, individual routers. You have to tag all the routing information. Then you program input filters and output filters at individual routers. And there are tons of papers written about why this is a hard problem. I just want to get across you know, for people who are unfamiliar. And you have to do all this low-level programming correctly. And not only that, you have to do it correctly such that when failures happen in the network, the network stays policy compliant. And this becomes very, very hard to reason about the correctness of what you've done with these low-level filters. So that's the fundamental difficulty, uh, why these programming errors that I was talking about, news highlights, they happen in there. So this is the problem we kind of want to tackle, essentially bridge this divide. Can we go directly from network-wide policies to router-level mechanisms that get automatically programmed 
and correct under all possible failures. Uh, so we took a first stab at this problem. Um, we developed a system uh, called Propane. And it's basically for centralized programming of distributed control planes. Uh, it comes in two parts. Uh, there's a language uh, to express the program, of course. And the language is, um, I think, I'll describe what it looks like. But for people who are familiar with SDN languages, it's kind of specifying kind of paths, just like it does. But because it's programmed on top of distributed control planes, we tell you have to you can tell us ahead of time what the fallback should be in case failures happen. So I prefer path P1 over P2 over P3 or P4. So you can basically express these constraints. That's kind of one kind of major difference. And there are other kind of minor differences. But the major difference here is because it's distributed control plane, you specify relative preferences. And of course, we have a compiler that takes this language and it configures router level mechanisms correctly. And the compiler guarantees uh, modular programming bugs, the logic guarantees that configurations are policy compliant under all failures. So that's kind of the guarantee the compiler's after. OK. Uh, so I'm going to motivate some of this, and as well as show kind of snippets of what propane looks like uh, uh, using some examples. And for those of who do not uh, configure routers, hopefully a couple of examples I'm going to give to that will get across the difficulty of the task as well. Yes. So just the previous slide, I mean, this is work from Princeton. I Princeton found it. Fact I, I guess the difference between this and fact I, the fact I is trying to program an open flow control plane, whereas you are trying to do uh, an arbitrary routing protocol control plane. Uh, we are also trying to do all possible failures. Not, I think my understanding of FATAR is uh, it would pre-program against maybe one failure or something, or there's some differences like that. Uh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And but we are yes. I think the other major difference is the failure model is different, but the other difference is yes. We are going to come up with BGP configuration ahead of time, not open flow rules. Uh, OK, so example one, simple backbone network. Assume these are your goals. No transit between peers. You prefer to go through R2, R1, and then peer one or two in that order. And you want to limit customers. So if you wanted to implement this policy today using distributed mechanisms, here's what you'll do. To provide no transit, you would basically, at those routers, you would tag incoming information as peer. Then you'll write blockers in both directions. So these are individual routers being programmed. So this is the top policy gets implemented this way. If you want to prefer these, you'll have to specify link. Local LP stands for local preference. It's basically the first number that gets used in BGP's decision process. And I believe higher is better, or uh, something like that. Uh, I, keep, I keep forgetting. You know, it's, it's, there's local preferences, and there are meds. But in some worlds, higher is better. Some worlds, lower is better. Uh, but you the, 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 you'll decide the ordering, essentially. Uh, what happens. And then you want to do filters because you want to limit your customer to this particular prefix and whatnot. So this is all of this you have to do. And now imagine somebody like at t or Microsoft trying to design configurations. You've got hundreds of routers and thousands of peers and try to get this right. That's basically the difficulty with distributed programming. And this is what it looks like with Propane today. Uh, you define a policy snippet, uh, no transit. It basically says, not transit. So the bold is essentially keywords in propane. And what's going to show up in brown, they are basically macros that will get expanded to something lower level. And we can define new macros. Uh, it basically says not transit, peer 1, peer 2. Define your routing preference. Define ownership. And then you say, basically, my policy is uh, no transit and preference and ownership. This is the extent of the propane program that's implementing this policy correctly. You don't need to talk about individual routers, individual peers, or links at all in there. And I'll show you how we compile it down to uh, BGP. So this is kind of like, OK, uh, this example is a bit more interesting. And uh, I'll try to work through it. I, I'm hoping half the people in the room understand how BGP works. Uh, but uh, the other half may not get it. Uh, I don't know which half. Uh, I think the ones wearing blue hats, maybe. Uh, OK, so take a, very t take a typical data center network. Um, your goals are, let's say, keep local prefixes, PL1, PL2 local, and you want to uh, basically, make sure that these prefixes don't go outside the data center, this yellow box. And you have some global services. They can go out. But make sure that you aggregate uh, the prefixes into a less specific prefix PG. So these are your goals. So let's see how you might implement this. Uh, one way to implement this is to say, OK, you know, anything I receive from GNH, observe that local services are hosted under our GH. Anything that comes from GHS routing information, don't send it out. 
So this is BGP's way. You know, routing information flows the opposite way from the data. So routing information goes out in this case, and data will come in. So you may choose to implement this at x and y, that anything you hear from GNH, don't export. It's very simple implementation. You don't have to talk about individual prefixes. And you basically say, yeah, when PG1 and PG2 come in, advertise PG, the less specific prefix out. So this implementation is actually not correct. Uh, so which BGP expert will tell me why is it not correct? Bruce. Because of a failure. Ah. You, you, um, you might, X might not learn about C if that link fails unless it learns it through Y and G. Ah, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, that, yeah, good job. <laughs> and I thought you were a theory person. <laughs> OK, so only, only, only the theoretician in the room could guess here, all the networking people. Uh, yeah, so that's exactly right. If those failures happen, um, X will learn about the local services here through C and D and not from GNH. And then these local services will get advertised externally. And this could be a huge security flaw. Or for whatever reason, you didn't want local services to go out. So what you might do is, OK, this is broken. Um, and Let's try to um, implement what's known as value-free routing. Disallow paths in the network that go up and down. So this could be you know, your second attempt at trying to implement this policy using distributed mechanisms. OK, so this too is broken. Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> because if, if you lose the link from C to X, okay. you're never going to learn about, well, I don't know, the same kind of, it's just because you're blocking you're just going to lose connectivity, possibly, from some prefixes that you want to advertise. Um, I think you're thinking along the right lines, but something, yeah, something worse can happen, uh, which is, anybody else want to take guesses? Bruce's lead. OK. So because yeah. somehow on the little butterflies you're making at the bottom, yeah. you know, if you lose some of those edges, you might want to do value routing. Um, yeah, um, I, I think, yes, once, I think you're getting to the point that va once you've introduced the value free routing, there are fewer paths in the network. Uh, but I think this is, this is a kind of like a more subtle, deeper problem, which is the following. That this is what, uh, so, okay, so I should have told you what aggregation semantics are, so my bad. So what aggregation semantics are, what router, when it's told to aggregate prefixes, what it does is as soon as it hears PG1 or PG2, it announces the less specific prefix PG outside. So it doesn't care about whether PG1 or PG2 are both present, only one is present or not. So what happens as a result is if this happens, that you see this specific pattern of failure, X will hear about PG2 but not PG1. And as soon as it hears about PG2, it will announce PG outside. Now what that will do, some of the traffic that will come to X will actually belong to PG1. And X now has no connectivity to PG1. And it will essentially drop all traffic going into PG1. So this is what's known as like an aggregation-induced black hole. So does this happen? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they are very, very hard to reason about today. And our guys run essentially simulations on top of the topology under to make sure you don't have aggregation black holes under uh, some number of failures that they care about. And so this is a big problem because aggregation is pervasive. And these systematic failures can happen. But would, yeah. the, would X actually uh, aggregate if it hadn't got any advertisement for PG1? Um, no, but it got one for PG2 was the problem. Yeah, yeah but right. But they would just advertise PG2. Uh, those are not the aggregation semantics, though. But it doesn't even know about PG2. Um, yeah, but it knows that it's supposed to do uh, announce PG, and it will announce PG as soon as it gets one. Those holes are hard to identify, right? X doesn't even know PG1 exists. So this is a bad policy. What, what do you want to do? What's the fix? Uh, this is uh, not a bad policy. This is a very common uh, policy. Uh, um, um, yeah, um, I think if you wanted tolerance to two failures, maybe you want to leave out value free routing. Um, as an implementation mechanism. Uh, because then if you didn't do value free writing, x will get PG1 through this longer path. Right, and that would be OK. So there is this conflict here. right? And you did value free routing to fix other issues, but this other issue came up. Do you 
you need to say valid rerouting only under these failure scenarios, or do you just allow? Uh, you don't get to say that. Yeah, you don't get to say that. At least today, there are no primitives that will let you say that. So, Dr. Lee, is it possible that these policies are not satisfiable under certain failure conditions? Um, and is what, that the kind of analysis your tool does? Uh, yes. If if given a policy that is not satisfiable under some conditions, we'll tell you it's not satisfiable. Yes. Okay, I'm a little confused. So I'm not a BGP expert, but yeah. I, I can't implement value routing under, say, no failures, and then fall back to, to value routing under certain failures? I can't write a complex configuration? No. You cannot write BGP policy that adapts to failures. That The policy itself can never change. You can change the policy by changing the configuration. If you have a controller on top that looks for failures and goes and changes BGP, yes, that can be done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so this is what this thing looks like in propane. You define where your prefixes reside uh, as a result of it, right? And you define PL1 and PL2 should be local. You specify a control primitive and you say my policy is routing and locality. That's all you need to do. And propane will generate either a correct configuration that's compliant under all failures or it will come back and say no can do, basically. Uh, okay. Uh, so how do we go from this language uh, to actual BGP configuration? It's a three or four step process. What I showed you was basically what we call the front end language for propane. It compiles down to some regular expression based language. Um, you feed in the topology and the core abstraction here on top of which a lot of this stuff happens is what we call the product graph. It's a product of topology and policy. And then we go and generate uh, track BGP from it. When there, I'm going to quickly run through uh, what these things mean. and we're happy to share kind of like a preprint uh, because I'm going to skip over details. Anupam? So I don't really know BGP very yeah, well, yeah. but can you tell us what would, what would your uh, uh, tool do if, when you give that uh, example? Yeah. Uh, in that example, it will tell you that um, I cannot give you guarantee. If you wanted value free routing as well as policy, I cannot give you guarantee under two failures. I don't think there's a way to kind of, oh, you, so you'll have to take out one of the constraints. Uh, but the note in, in this one, I did not specify value free as a constraint. The value free came in to fix another problem, which actually should be fixed using prefix based filters and not router based filters. So, propane will do the correct thing there. Nate? Can you clarify the failure model now? So, I thought the failure model was under all failures, but you just said under two failures. Oh, no. So, so, okay. So, we give a separate guarantee of uh, aggregation black holes under K failures. Yeah. Uh, so, that, right, right. Yeah, right, 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, OK, uh, so I'm going to quickly run through it and, and skip over a lot of details. Uh, we translate. We, so first step, you know, going from just propane to regular IR, we take all constraints for a particular prefix, combine them together modularly such that, you know, so I've combined PG1, PG2 had only one, PL1 and PL2 had two. So you basically get this policy out. Um, we we expand these macros into regular expressions. Out means anything that's outside the network that you're trying to configure right now. In is anything that's inside the network you're trying to configure out. And these have somewhat what you might think as intuitive explanations. Uh, one thing I should say is that in describing propane, we are describing the way data flows, not the way routing flows. So that's why you know when you say like start at x, x should come first. When we say end at x, x should end last. And we expand them out into regular expressions in there. Uh, but this is the more interesting part. The regular expression trans, uh, this thing called that we call product graph. So I'm going to run through it with an example. Uh, let's say your policy was that you prefer these brown paths over uh, the purple ones. So that's the policy. You like to go through W A C D and then out uh, over W B somewhere else and then out. Uh, so the first thing we do is we convert each of these kind of uh, paths into uh, what uh, we call reverse policy automata. So here's what's happening. Uh, we look at this policy, and then we are kind of working through and building an automata that represents the policy. And this reverse automata is reverse in the, because it's capturing the flow of routing information. So if routing information were to flow from outside to D, C, A, W, the routing path would be W, A, C, D, O. Oh. So, uh, so it takes a little bit while building kind of intuition, so this may not clear. But similarly, you can have a reverse policy automata for the other policy, and this is what comes out. Okay, 
so, so now the core abstraction, uh, which is the product graph, uh, we take this reverse policy automata, we throw topology at it, and we generate the product of topology and policy. Start is where the routing information starts. It enters the network at x. So what x11 basically means there, x is the node there. Uh, and one means basically you're in state one with respect to this automata, and state one with respect to that automata. So that's what x11 means. And we are basically encoding, marrying the two together. That's why it's called the product graph. It goes to D, C, A, W, N. And you can build it out essentially completely. So hopefully you're getting at least some intuition around what's going on, uh, since I'm already at zero time. Apologize for that. Um, and so we get this product graph. And essentially, the property here is that every path in the product graph from start to end is a path, a policy compliant path, per one of the two policies uh, in the topology. Right. So it captures compactly all of, all of the possible paths that are policy compliant. Uh, then we do, I'm going to skip on that, then we have a way to minimize the product graph uh, to take out loops and paths that don't make any sense. Uh, and we get a minimal product automata. And then compilation to BGP, I'll just take 30 seconds to explain that, what's going on, is if you wanted to encode this product graph using BGP, essentially what each router needs to do is to attach some communities to remember where the path came in and where the path went, and BGP will find a path for you. So in this case, C will allow imports per the product graph for routing information to come in from D, and when it goes out, it will tag it when it announces it to A, so you know which path you're walking in, the, in that way. So that works, uh, but the problem here is we didn't actually specify preference. So one thing I actually forgot to tell you in a rush, there one and two here basically means which paths are preferred. So you prefer paths that end at this W over, over this W, and this is your lower preference is better, this is second. So because I did not actually encode preferences, uh, you could end up with a path that is less preferred in the topology. So then we figured out a way to actually encode preferences in there. Uh, such that BGP will find the best path um, dynamically. The key idea here is to essentially make sure that, so okay, so this is BGP. I do apologize for mismanagement of time, so but I'm gonna, the main idea here is that C has a choice um, because this is C and this is C. In the topology, it is one node. C, when it gets routing information from E and from D, it has to make a choice. Which one should I prefer? The notion here is that you don't know what's going to happen downstream. So the worry here is that you might say, OK, you know, I prefer D because it leads to a low preference path. The problem here is that downstream, you may see a failure because of which uh, C will regret making that choice of D uh, because the, a policy compliant path may not be available. OK, I've lost everybody here. Uh, OK, uh, come talk to me offline. Or better yet, come talk to Ryan. I'll go talk to Ryan offline. Um, uh, but the idea is we have this notion, when can C safely make the choice of D? So this is the fault tolerance analysis. And, and when, can C, when will C not regret making a particular choice? And based on that, we assign local preferences. And things work out in there. Uh, trust me, they do. OK. Um, uh, and we have a compiler. Uh, it's, uh, it's on GitHub, the language, the whole system, and compiler implement stuff. And, uh, and Ryan learned F Sharp while he was at Microsoft. And he wrote up everything in 55 lines of code, essentially, of F Sharp, which will expand to 40,000 of Java. So don't do it in <laughs> Java. Uh, uh, just some empirical data since you know I do systems. Uh, so I have to put a graph, at least some graph. Uh, we encoded essentially, so uh, we encoded Microsoft's policies uh, into propane, both our backbone policies and our data center policies. Um, the only thing, the, the two interesting things here is that uh, propane is expressive enough for us to encode uh, real networking policies. The, comp the compilation times don't really matter because this is an offline process, but the only takeaway there is, yeah, we can do it, right? Uh, it takes nine minutes or three minutes, that's not a huge amount of time. Okay. So I'll basically end here. Uh, so the underlying thesis for the start of this work was that if we did centralized programming of distributed control planes, we can marry essentially resilience and programmability. And propane is essentially the first step there, uh, which we take essentially BGP configurations uh, from high level policies and with the underlying control plane abstraction like product graph. So what Aditya presented, to tie it back to Aditya's talk yesterday, what he presented for instance was, I think he came at it from the opposite direction 
a verification based control plane abstraction arc and it's trying to use it for kind of synthesis now. We came at it from the other way. We had an abstraction inspired by kind of synthesis, the product graph, and now we're trying to see what kind of like the interplay here might be. And what Ryan's busy doing these days is that I think he's basically taking this whole system to another level of abstraction. What we found was uh, network engineers today don't reason about concrete topologies at all. This is what we learned both at Microsoft and Google. But instead, they'll draw some abstract topology diagrams. You have layer one here, layer two here. So we're trying to take this whole system to that level of abstraction right now. At the same time, exploring product graphs as a general abstraction for verification and synthesis to encode more than just PGP. All right, thank you. Yeah. So can you express things like meds and, and the fact that some are rat reflectors and who are their clients? Um, uh, we can do meds. Uh, actually, I quickly glossed over. Uh, yeah, so, so meds we do. Uh, route reflectors we don't do currently. Uh, I think we, um, um, and that requires us to reason about IGP. So, so far the work has assumed a full IBGP mesh. Or if your route reflector, or we can assume route reflector configuration is correct and all BGP information is flowing to every other source. But these are kind of some of the pragmatic uh, extensions we are kind of looking for. Can we just do both the IGP as well as some of these more um, uh, scalable route reflecting yeah, configurations? You mentioned arbitrary carrier mode, so you can do the, the uh, algorithm scale and sort of to consider. Um, yeah, so I think we have conservative uh, analysis for all failures. So uh, essentially, so it's, uh, it's not, it's not, yeah, it's not precisely reasoning about all failures. We have heuristics that are really fast. Um, that yeah, and after we put into heuristics, we haven't needed, uh, we haven't yet found counterexamples where the conservative tends to be too conservative. But we keep looking. But it's not precise. Yeah, so it, it is. Your your intuition is correct. The underneath exact computation is combinatorial. So I might misunderstood, but how does the number of communities uh, grow with complexity? How does what, sorry? The number of communities you need to use, does it grow? Uh, uh, um, so the simplest version of the compiler, and Ryan sitting back there, correct me, uh, we attach essentially communities as soon as the routing information comes in uh, to remember where it came in from. And then we have a minimization step where if communities are not needed, uh, we kind of remove them. But is there a worst case of how many it might flow up to? Um, I think it just depends on number of entry points into the network for, for a given routing announcement. Do you want to chime in, Ryan? Uh, it's related to the number of uh, states I see. in the product graph. I see. But then you can localize that per, per router. Yeah, okay. okay. So the states that you had the tuple, mm -hmm. that also the number of entries in the tuple grows with how many different? Uh, the number of entries in the tuple will grow with the number of relative paths you specified for a prefix. So yeah. So and uh, in general, you would have you know if you did a classic thing like you know prefer customer, peer, provider. So there'll be kind of three of those, and depending on yeah the complexity of the preferences you're specifying. Amen. I'm just wondering, have, have you had a case where you take a very simple policy and run it through this tool and the resulting config looks horrendous? Uh, um, I, I, I think we, we work, we've been working over time in essentially, I think a step I missed was like a final step, we do have configuration minimization. Um, but uh, I, I think, and we analyze the differences between generated and like design configs as well. I think there are certain constructs that operators use that we are not using right now, like you know peer groups and policy groups and whatnot that provide essentially, it, it's, I think a simple line-to-line -line matching is out there. We're not generating something that's the same level. I don't think that's the goal. But yes, yeah, some level of readability and debuggability is the goal, and we're just trying to reduce by taking things out. Nate? Uh, two quick questions. Yeah. So uh, I saw Jacob was talking yeah. about you. My questions were from his talk. Yeah, yeah. So you're, you provide a number of guarantees. Yeah. And these hold as in that fish when you reach conversions. So yeah. during periods of reconfiguration, there could be arbitrary things happening. Yeah. Is there any hope of? Uh, not arbitrary. I think, uh, so Ryan and I had a long discussion. I think an invalid path will never be taken because filter control plane filters are installed. What can happen is that uh, a higher preference path may not be taken during transient periods, even though it exists. 
So is there any hope of doing better, of providing essentially invariants that don't, uh, aren't just from convergence to convergence, but are Oh, on, on transient behaviors? And then my second question is related. Yeah. What, have you, what properties have you proved, and like how, how were these proved? Did you develop an operational model of PGP and prove these things by induction? Or is that's, that's too difficult, yeah. Um, I, I'll answer the first one, and I'll defer to Ryan for a second. I, I think that this is, I think the question you're asking, like, can, it's, it's more fundamental than what we're doing. Like, can a distributed control plane ever give you ability to reason about transients? Yeah, I, I, I don't know the answer. Yeah. What? Um, I, I, I think transient things happen, and, you know, they've been happening for years. Operators don't tend to worry about it too much. Um, but I don't know of a general way to guarantee in a distributed control plane some sanity of transients. Um, yeah. And the second one, I'll let Ryan answer. Uh, so we have sort of like high level proofs that we're writing on the chemical So they're not sort of. So I guess the one reason I asked is do you have a, a model of the subset of BGP you're using? That, that, I mean, that would be useful for other people who are in this space. Clean. Uh, so what we're working with right now is um, so we're going to stack that and form a model of BGP. Okay, thank you.